In this video, or in this episode, I'm going to tell you guys the whole story, okay? I'm going to tell you how I was able to move from Nigeria to the UK. I'm going to tell you all the mistakes I made along the way. I'm going to tell you how I was able to remedy those mistakes to make sure that my chances were not jeopardized for me to come over to the UK, all right? So if you're interested in moving from Nigeria or if you're interested in moving from wherever you are around the world to the UK, I suggest you keep it locked on to this channel. I'm going to rush off to the market and you guys already know. You already know what comes next. Let's get it. You know the way I do it when I drop lyrical. Anytime I spit lyrical, philosophical. All the niggas mimical, but they stare still. On take your little roll. Punch my score. Hello Chronics, hello YouTube, how are you, you and you all doing today? It's still your value based king fuse out with another value packed episode. Now like I said in the introduction, in this episode I'm going to be telling you guys everything I did, all the steps I went through to move myself from Nigeria to the UK. All the mistakes I made along the way. And you know how it is, guys. If you see someone that has been able to go from point A to point B and point B is your destination and the person is willing and able to tell you the mistakes you made along the way, then it's all good. It's all joy because it means you can cut out those mistakes and get to that destination quicker. So that's what this episode is supposed to do for you guys. So without any further ado, let me just jump right into it. So I did not plan to come to the UK, guys. This was not the plan. The plan was actually for me to go to Canada. So I'm in the UK studying for my PhD. I'm in the UK. I've always wanted to bag a PhD. I've always wanted to go in for my PhD. But I, if you combine the hustle, if you combine work, if you combine family, you have never quite found the time, the chance, the opportunity to get away for this purpose. So I... Mm, the chance came, okay? The chance came, I was just thinking about it, and then someone had had a conversation with me, a family member had a conversation with me and said, listen, why don't you think about this? And this was something I was thinking about already, but I did not think of the UK. I never thought about this was where I wanted to go to to get this done. I actually was planning to go to Canada, and I even started processing the school I wanted to go to in Canada, but... Okay, let me just get right there real quick because I don't want this video to stretch on for too long, but I think it just might stretch on for too long. So the first mistake I made was applying to one school. Okay, so that is one. The first mistake I made was applying to one school in Canada. Now, there's a reason why educational tourist consultants would tell you that try to apply to a minimum of three schools. But... You know how it is when you're thinking about money, 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 you're looking for the most affordable schools and you don't want to apply to schools that are very expensive. And the school I found was very, very affordable. It was very cheap. It was, they were charging international students the same rate or at the same rate that they were charging local students. If you want to know the name of this school, why don't you leave it, leave it down in the comment section. I'm going to share it with you. I found this school. And I applied to it. So guys, if you're applying for a PhD, it's different from when you're applying for a master's degree. There's a whole lot of things that go into applying for a PhD. You need to do your research, your feasibility study, your research proposal. You need to do your personal statement. There's a whole lot of research and, and writing that goes into applying for a PhD. And I did all those. In fact, I got to school. I applied for two separate group of supervisors and I got an interview with one. Now, they're going to tell you guys that you don't need to be experienced. You don't need to be an experienced researcher. That is horse crap. <laughs> They are looking for seasoned researchers. So after they asked me questions, I made a good argument for myself. They were impressed with everything I've been able to do after I finished my master's. They told me, do you have any research background and blah, 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 blah. I say, um, <laughs> I really do not have any research background other than the research I do in my line of work. That was what undid that. Now, the second researcher, 
I, when I applied to this particular supervisor, not research, the second supervisor, when I applied for this supervisor to be my supervisor for my PhD research um, endeavor, at the time, lecturers or teachers in Canada were on strike, at least in that particular city, they were on strike. So I got a message from the first supervisor and the second supervisor telling me that, listen, they're on strike. I should, someone will get back to me or I should send an email to this person if it's an emergency. I sent an email to that person and they told me that I should not worry that and they'll get back to me after the strike. They finished, the strike was over and nobody got back to me. Now, this was where everything started going downhill. I did not even know the strike was over, but I still kept sending emails. The thing with Canada, guys, they, they don't respond. They don't respond to you when you send emails out. They never, but just keep sending, just keep sending. I think the problem with me was I didn't send enough emails out. But eventually, my supervisor or would-be supervisor reached out to me telling me that, oh my God, that my topic is so good that she would have loved to supervise my topic, but after the strike was over, she went on holiday and now she's full. She's gotten all her students and that was how I was unable to get that university. And even when I reached out to the admissions department, they told me that she not worry. I should just keep um, sending my documents, my credentials, that I don't need a supervisor to get into the university. But the same admissions department got back to me at the end of the day telling me that, listen, I was not able to get a supervisor and because of this they cannot give me the admission so that was how my plans to go to canada to study fell through you get it that's how it didn't work so when it failed when everything failed don't forget the first failure the first mistake i made was applying to just one school one university guys listen even if the university is expensive just apply you can always pay your tuition fee in installments that was what i didn't think about from the very beginning so i'd almost given up hope i told myself oh my god because i gave myself a timeline i said listen by this date i should be out of nigeria that was the plan I'd given up hope. I'd already told myself, okay, maybe it's going to be to 2024. Then I was driving my car. I can't even remember where I was going to on the day. And I heard some someone, I heard a jingle on the radio, UK Education Trade Fair. Um, if you're interested in going to the UK to study, blah, blah, blah. You know how they do it. And I just told myself, well, I never wanted to go to the UK. I'm not interested. So guys in life, never say never. I, I don't know. Women out there, women will tell you this. That guy who was always striking them, toasting them, courting them, and I want to marry you. And they say, I'm never going to get married to a short person. I'm never going to get married to this. Many years later, they just wake up in bed and the same person they said they were not going to get married to was the same person they see lying right next to them in bed, they're married. So it was the same thing that happened to me. I always told myself I was never going to go to the UK. I don't want to go back to the UK. I did my master's in the UK and I don't want to go there anymore. And I think I was having this conversation with my wife because my wife was telling me, oh my God, you trying to tell me that this stuff did not work because I did my IELTS test. I got a 7.5 band. It took me five days. You guys already know. I, I made a video of that IELTS test. I think I'm going to leave it somewhere up there if you've not watched it. How I just used five days to prepare for the house and I got a 7.5 band. Everything was good. Everything was set. I'd paid my application fees, but somehow it didn't work. I was just, it was very upsetting. And my wife just kind of encouraged me, why don't you just go for this educational trade fair? They're not asking for money. They're not asking for anything. And I went for the educational trade fair, met, I saw a lot of schools there that I was not interested in. I saw a lot of schools that I was not interested in, but somehow I just saw Bournemouth University. And maybe it's because Bournemouth football team, I love, I, I watch football, and Bournemouth football team is a very good team. So maybe this was the reason why I went to their stand and I met their representative and we spoke and they told me to send my credentials, blah, blah, blah. And that was how I sent my credentials. They loved what they saw. And then I started writing my research proposal, my feasibility study, my personal statement. Again, I must have written, without exaggerating, I must have written up to 10 different research proposals for my PhD. Personal statement, the same 10. I must have written like a truckload of, of documentation, doing research. You would think I'd already started the PhD program. <laughs> it was that intense. So, but the good thing was when I reached out to supervisors in Bournemouth University, I had everybody scrambling to get me to supervise my work, even down to the maths department, the law department. And my research topic has to do with marine based entrepreneurship. So, 
they were all scrambling. They were all fighting to supervise me. So I narrowed down on two supervisors who were affiliated to the Bournemouth University Business School. We did an interview. I think we did two separate interviews and everything turned out well. They sent me my offer, my conditional offer. Then I had to pay £3,000. And guys, let me just say this at this junction. Nobody, all these educational tourist consultants, they don't even know the cost. And I'm, I'm going to stress it because it's very annoying. They don't even know the cost of people going to the UK to study. I found this the hard way. And listen, I'm going to say this right now, guys, without even mincing words. If I would known the amount of money is going to cost me, to come to the UK to do my PhD, I probably wouldn't have started the process. Because when you go to the gov.co.uk website, the information you get there and the information you meet when you start processing your application, your admission and all that are different. I'm going to give you an example. When it was time to pay my tuition fee, it was straightforward from the university. Just pay a deposit of £3,000 and your conditional offer is going to change to unconditional offer. That was very simple. It was very straightforward. It was was no big deal and hope that thankfully at the time I was already working I had I'd been working for a while as a matter of fact so I had some savings so I just converted some money and I paid the three thousand pounds and it became an unconditional offer okay I paid my accommodation deposit I think it was 250 pounds I paid that but when it became time to process the visa that was when the story changed and changed very quickly very very quickly because you will see on the gov.co.uk website that you have to pay a healthcare surcharge. And I've even said it in my previous videos, if you follow this channel, if you've been watching our content, it's £625 for a year. But what nobody tells you guys, and this is probably the first mistake that you would probably, this is probably another mistake that you will probably make. What nobody tells you guys is the fact that you would have to pay £600 and 25 pounds for the duration of time that you are going to be studying in the UK. For me, I'm doing a PhD and I was given four years to come to the UK to study. I had to pay 625 pounds per year for the whole four years and I had to pay it at once. So I had to pay 2,308 pounds 50 pence. I cannot forget it. That sum is stitched to the back of my brain. I had to pay a visa fee of $475. Did you get it? $475. Okay, let me take it back, guys. You are going to pay your healthcare surcharge in pounds. So I paid you in dollars. So I paid $3,308.50, but you have to pay for your visa application fee in pounds. So that was 475 pounds. But this has since increased, guys. It's not the same. It's not the same amount of money that you are going to pay now. I think now the visa fee for students now, I think is 575, or be 500, I think it's either 575 pounds or 595 pounds is increased. And your dependent is now 675 pounds or thereabout for visa application fees. Now, when I was planning, guys, in this video, I'm going to tell you guys everything. I'm not even going to censor anything. I'm going to tell you how it happened. I was supposed to come to the UK with my family, my wife and my four kids. Everything was planned out. But like I said, because nobody told me the amount of money that you're going to pay, and even when you do your research, you never see all this out there. When I did the calculation for everything with my family, I think the total amount of money came to... I think it was fifteen or sixteen thousand dollars for the healthcare surcharge for all six of us, and visa application. The visa application fee probably came up to something as crazy or as insane as uh, two, two to five thousand pounds or thereabouts. That was how I had to come alone because I'm the primary applicant. I have to resume uni. I have to actually take up the position or it would expire. And if you don't resume uni to a particular date, they will tell you the date. The university will tell you, you have to be here by this time or you would have to forfeit your admission. And your deposit, the £3,000 you paid, you would have to forfeit it. It is not going to be refunded. It's not refundable. It's only refundable if something happens, maybe you were sick, maybe you were denied visa for some reason or that was not your doing, they will refund you back the money. But other than this, 
they don't refund the money. So that was how I paid the healthcare surcharge. I paid for my visa application fee. Guys, if you ask me, I would tell you guys, while you are applying for your visa, if you can pay for the priority service, which is 250 pounds, or the super priority service, which is I think 350 pounds, do it. Please do it. Because I wanted to pay for the priority service, but I didn't have pounds. I only had dollars at the time. I didn't have pounds, and so I couldn't do it. My visa took, because I applied for the visa in August, and I didn't get it in August. I didn't get it in September. I got it at the end of October. The university literally was tired. They kept asking me what is happening. And even my accommodation that I had gotten, because I thought my visa was going to come very quickly. I got in my accommodation. I signed the contract. They started asking me to pay my first, my first installment. It was, it was mad. It was insane. So you need to make sure, guys, you need to make sure that you get your visa application process sorted. Please, if you can, if you can afford it, pay for the priority service or the super priority service. Super priority service, make sure that you get your visa in 24 hours, literally. Priority service, you get it in five days. You just get it and you move on with the process. It's done, dusted, and you're moving on to the next cut. Do you get it? Another thing that guys that you need to do and many people don't do is when if you're not applying for the priority service or super priority service, try to upload all your documents when you are trying to book for your submission of your, your documents through TLS concept, TLS contact. S upload everything. Even your your IOM tuberculosis test, they will tell you that IOM will send it to them directly. Don't even don't believe that stuff. Send, upload all your documents, your proof of finances, your documents that you used to get admission, your proof that you were working, your contract letter, everything that you need to upload. Upload it to the TLS contact website. Upload it. This was a mistake. This was one of the things that made my visa process to extend forever. They kept asking me documents. What about your tobacco test? And I sent it. What about your admission letter? What about your this? What about your employment history? What about, what were you doing from this period to this? They kept asking for information, 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 and information. Have enough money in your account. If you're traveling to the UK, have at least, if you're in Nigeria, have at least 20 million naira. At least 20 million naira in your account. If you're traveling with your family, maybe a family of three, a family of four, if you, you, your wife, and three kids or four kids, try to have at least 30 to 35 million in your account. If you can do it, make it 40 million, good. I, if you don't have money and you want to know how you can get this to work, just drop me a message in the comment section. I'm going to tell you how you can do this stuff. Guys, it's possible. But you need to make sure you don't make mistakes. Another thing that you should do is try to get a remote job in Nigeria or in Ghana or in the Philippines or in Myanmar or in India. Wherever you are trying to move from, try to get a remote work from there. Maybe as a tutor, an English tutor, maybe as a business consultant, maybe as a business protocol officer, maybe as a customer service representative, just get a remote job. Guys, you will thank me later. When you get into the country, you're not going to be scampering around looking for a job because listen, I'm not going to lie to you guys. I'm not flush for cash. I didn't come to the UK with money. I've not even paid the rest of my tuition fees. I'm still trying to figure that out. That's how much lack of finances I used to get into the UK. But the remote work I was doing in Nigeria is what I've been using to hold myself down this whole time. And you are not going to be taxed because the company is paying the money into the account in your home country. So you can literally just get someone there to get receive the money or you transfer the money to someone there to do the conversions and send you pounds in the UK. That way you, you, you have that cushion. You have that, that kind of shocker zubber that holds you down in the UK that it's gonna just cushion you against any hardship and you're not gonna be scampering around desperately looking for jobs or looking for something that's gonna give you money. You're gonna take your time to just get into the groove of things, the swing of things before you understand. I'm, listen, I'm not, I'm not saying that the remote work you get, you're gonna be doing it forever because if you're doing your master's or like me, you're doing your PhD, you are not going to have a lot of time to be working 
literally 24 hours even though you can work 24 hours because you're not bound under the statute of your 20 hour per week in your visa because literally you got the job in a, in your country and you're not being paid into your uk account you're being paid into your home your local account in your home country but you still don't have time to spend working every day because now i've not started my research work i'm literally working like full time working in the morning afternoon and evening and that but when i start my research work like in ennis i know i'm not gonna have the time but at least i would have earnings that's gonna keep me afloat keep me in the black maybe not in the green in the black because pounds it's bigger than any other currency and the company i'm working with is not paying me in pounds but they're paying me in foreign currency but not in pounds so get remote work. Listen, guys, I'm not going to stress it enough. Get something remote that you were doing from Nigeria. That you just come here and you can just be doing it till you get something that is decent that you can fall back on. Okay, this is the mistake that many people make. They come to the UK and they're just scampering, looking for anything. So they end up go working in a warehouse and burning themselves out. So it doesn't make any any sense at all i'm trying to think whether there was any other mistake i made yes there was if you are packing your stuff guys if you want to come with food stuff by, by all means because i've been looking for ordinary egusi so egusi is processed melon that we use in preparing soup in nigeria i've been looking for ordinary egusi and i can't even find it in Bournemouth. someone told me to go to a an african store called maka and i am going to try to go there this where i can get melon so i can prepare egusi soup but if you can come with food stuff some food stuff one of my flatmates came with massive food stuff dry fish stock fish egusi gari gindomi everything if you can come with food stuff come with food stuff but don't think too much about clothes don't pack all the clothes in the world and come that's the mistake many people make they pack all the clothes there's there's there there are stores here that sell very affordable clothes. There's vintage stores. There are stores that sell secondhand clothes. There's Primark that sells affordable clothes. Come with food stuff that is just going to be... It's just going to keep you afloat for the meantime. You're not going to be wasting money going to KFC, paying ten ninety eight like they charged me the last time when I went to town. But you have something that's just going to keep you going for the first couple of months while you're here. The, the, the objective the objective is just to find your footing. If you can get your footing in this country, everything is just going to be good from there. It's going to be smooth sailing from there. Okay. So guys, these are the mistakes that I made or the mistakes that most people make when they come into the country ask questions this is the mistake you will probably start to make from nigeria thinking that you're going to do all the research yourself and you're going to get all the answers come to channels like this fuse chronicles and leave leave questions leave questions in a comment section dumb questions it doesn't matter it doesn't matter at all leave questions ask questions how much do you pay how much do you do this what did it cost you to do that Le ask questions guys the questions the answers you get from this question is going to be the difference between you doing the right thing going to the right destination i just found out just literally yesterday that bonmont does not have big industries they're not big industries here they're small scale businesses and medium scale businesses in this town so if you're looking to get the Microsofts of this world, if you're looking to go get the Facebooks of this world, it's not in this town. And you need to go to, co to communities or, or counties where there are opportunities for you. Whether you want to stay back in the UK or you want to start working while you're studying, you need a community where there are big companies for you to earn more money. So this is another mystic. So I could keep going on and on and on, but I'm going to tell you guys that if you have inquiries or questions, go down to the comment section. Don't let that space go to waste. Go down there and leave your inquiries down there. And I always respond to every inquiry. So guys, I really want you guys to do me a favor. Go down, smash the subscribe button, turn on the notification bell, like our video, share them with your friends, family members, particularly those who are looking to go abroad to destination nations like the UK. Let them be guided on the best possible decisions to make and let us by all means, by all means, let us grow together. Because if my channel is doing well, which means YouTube is going to take this video and show it to more people like you around the world who are looking for this type of genuine content. Okay. And if you're interested in knowing more, if you're interested in knowing about the changes in the UK government, the 
the cabinet reshuffle that has taken place and how this is going to affect your chances of coming to the UK from January, why don't you click on the video that's going to pop up to my right that's going to take you to that content so you can catch that information that has dropped already. And until the next one, I remain your value-based king fuse. I'll catch you guys on the next cut. Bye-bye for now.